Welcome everybody. Today we are going to do a presentation. We're going to explore the geography of recovery. I think this is important because when we see discussions around mental illness, often it's very focused on just managing the mental illness. And even if we're going to therapy, a lot of the times that'll be focused on just managing mental illness symptoms rather than getting over it. But it is, it is possible to get over mental illness and leave it behind. Hopefully this uh, exploration today will give you an idea of the types of challenges that'll come up along the way. And I will usually on this stream, we do totally questions and answers around mental health and recovery. I'll do questions at the end. So yeah, absolutely have conversations in the chat, uh, explore with each other, but for the duration of going through the slides and the illustrations, all of that kind of stuff, I won't be hopping into the chat. So just anybody uh, throwing a super serious question in there. Uh, I'm not ignoring your question. <laughs> I, I can't even see it. But after the presentation, uh, I'll, you know, close a bunch of windows <laughs> on my computer and I'll be able to see the chat. We'll go through any questions you have. Uh, so community in the chat, feel free to uh, chat with each other, answer questions and discuss. And then um, after this portion, we'll get to uh, yeah, any of the topics you want to explore. And of course, we can look at, say, particular challenges you're running into and look at it in the context of what we're talking about uh, here. Some of you may be wondering, uh, especially if you're new, uh, you just saw this video, you're like, oh, I, I want to know about the geography of recovery, me wondering who I am. There's, you know, of course, my channel, please subscribe, all of that, uh, where you can learn a lot more about the things I do around mental health and my own experience. But to yeah, let you know quickly, I used to struggle with a bunch of mental illness diagnoses uh, across the board, struggled with really violent, intrusive thoughts that had just always been there my entire life. So I, I thought that was normal. When I went to get help for my mental health, I didn't even bring them up because I just thought that's how brains work. Uh, but I struggled with depression. You know, I got diagnosed with OCD. I used to do things like stand in front of my stove and watch it because I would, I would go through all these checking rituals and then I would just do them so much I could no longer trust them. So I would just, I would just stand there and be like, I, I can feel it's off. I can see it's off. But what if, what if it's not? Uh, I thought people were trying to poison me. I had all sorts of compulsions around food. I struggled with emetophobia, misophonia. There were sounds I couldn't be around. They would, they would cause me pain. Uh, yeah, tons of paranoia. I always thought people were watching me. I thought I was going to kill people. I thought people were going to kill me. I couldn't use knives. The works. So there's there's too many uh symptoms and struggles to get into now but the key thing is that i don't struggle with those anymore and it really helped me to recognize that i i just had a very human brain and i had to learn how to interact differently with my brain and that involved changing things i was doing out in the real world, but also changing things I was doing internally inside my head and how I interacted with thoughts and emotions and physical sensations and urges and all of that. What I'll explore today is what we often run into as we're taking that journey. And so uh, I've been you know, over the mental illness diagnosis for more than 10 years now. And I've been doing a lot of work with people over the years. I've run a peer support charity. Uh, there's a wonderful community that uh, I'm part of and I collaborate with online uh, where we work on recovery skills. I've worked with people around the world for many years, uh, helping them navigate the changes with recovery. So what we'll explore today is both taken from my own personal experience, uh, but also working with 
uh, many people over the years to see what's very common as we take this journey from really struggling with our brains uh, to really getting along pretty damn well with our brains. So today we'll go through three sections. So chapter one is the cliff. It's going to be all about the really terrible challenges uh, that we run into. So often where we start to realize there's a problem that we want to do something about. The second chapter is going to be about the plateau. And this is important. This is where people, I would say, often get stuck. Uh, or they find themselves, hey, I've made some progress and I, oh, I keep going back to the compulsion. So how do, I, how do I get off that plateau? How do I really leave the mental illness behind and make things about my mental health and where I want to go? And that's what we'll look at in the third chapter, a new direction. So where do we take ourselves uh, to really leave the mental illness behind? Let's get into it. First up, the cliff. I'm gonna I'm gonna take my little video away down here, but I'll I'll pop back in sometimes, and definitely at the end I'll come back. But for now, uh, let's uh, yeah, let's just explore the illustrations, and I'll explain them as we go through them. So the cliff. It has helped me to understand that uh, life is very much like a wilderness. And for a variety of reasons, you know, we, we start off in a particular area of the wilderness of life with privileges and challenges around us and inside of us. And also the directions we take initially through that wilderness, they're, they're things we think we should do. They're often things we've been taught to do or they're things we've been required to do by society and our environment. So for whatever reason, though, as we're taking that direction, we thought we should take that we thought was normal. Eventually, we get to a point where we realize we're at the bottom of a cliff. There's this big barrier in our way, and we start to understand there's all of these compulsions there. All of these things we're doing to manage and control <clears throat> uncertainty and anxiety and other feelings we don't like. So you can see here a list of compulsions stacked up on the cliff, like checking if you're real, not driving, checking for poison, correcting bad thoughts, pushing away people, checking for depression, <clears throat> obsessing about recovery, ruminating, people pleasing, procrastination, correcting people on social media, micromanaging. This person you'd see really struggles with control. <clears throat> they wanna get control and certainty. All of these compulsions here, and there would be tons more. This is, I'd say, I would say this is, understand this is a small list. This is a very tiny list of things people would run into, but so useful to understand that they're all quite connected, even though they might seem kind of different and we'll get into how they're connected. Seeing that these compulsions are connected is, is going to be a key help with recovery. You might also notice that some of these are probably things you may not consider compulsions. Or in a clinical context, they wouldn't be seen as compulsions. And there's, there's this kind of dividing line in the mental health world between clinical and what we'll see as normal. I didn't find that helpful. I thought all of my compulsions were normal and totally rational. It was really important for me to cut out all of the compulsions throughout my life, including the ones that even other people would say those are normal. So understand that as we go through this, you may see some things as like normal, be like, hey, doesn't everybody do that? Yes, absolutely. Just like with physical fitness, Taking care of your mental health is not normal. You're going to do a lot of things that most people don't do if you want to build great mental health and fitness, just like with physical fitness. So, yeah, we're going to go after a bunch of things that are normal. But at first, 
absolutely. We probably realize we've come to this cliff because there's stuff going on, like checking if we're real, obsessing about whether we're not real, avoiding driving because we think we're going to hit people or we're going to be in an accident. We don't want to handle the guilt of that. There's going to be that stuff at first that's very noticeable, a problem. And we start to cut it out. Maybe we go to therapy. We grab a good book that teaches us how to cut out compulsions. We work with a peer support group and we start climbing up that cliff. And at first, it's going to be really difficult. This is sweaty, challenging work. It's no different than going for a run for the first time in your life. You are going to be sore. You're going to be sweating. Your heart's going to be racing. Your lungs are going to be pounding. And that's okay. We wouldn't, we wouldn't see that as meaning you have some kind of strange disorder if you started exercising for the first time and found it very difficult. Understand that's the same with mental health because I think a lot of people expect it not to feel bad. And then they, when it does, they see it as meaning something. But really, really embrace it in the same way we embrace physical fitness. That's why, that's why our little person here has some sweat um, and a not too happy face. At first, it's quite challenging. I know for me, the very first compulsion I had to cut out, I, I couldn't. I struggled. I tried so many times. It was supposed to be the easiest compulsion to cut out. And it, I just every time I tried, I just ended up doing more and more compulsions. Uh, and it, it was going to be about not checking the door lock when I left the house. And I, I couldn't. I just, I just stayed in the house doing more. I was like checking if the toaster was unplugged. I hadn't used the toaster in a week. All sorts of things like that. It took me two weeks to cut out the first easiest compulsion. Uh, and then I was just stuck in the hallway uh, having a panic attack. And that's okay. It doesn't mean you're treatment resistant. It doesn't mean there's something specially wrong with you. That is just normal for a human trying to make a change. But as we do that more, we start to see that we can do it. You start to see that, you know, for example, not driving on there. You, you start to drive and you do it. You invite the brain to come along with you. And, and pretty soon you're doing it all the time and the, the brain starts to shut up. And you see that you can start to do all of these things that you thought you couldn't do. And you climb that cliff. You stop checking your food. You stop throwing it out because you worry it's poisoned. You, know, you stop obsessing about recovery. Stop you know, watching you know, YouTube videos every time you get anxious. Uh, stop like trying to correct thoughts. You start advocating yourself, cutting out that people pleasing. You're setting healthy boundaries, taking up space, being honest, risking that people could be hurt or people could be upset. And you, it starts to be good. Like you really uh, start to enjoy that. This makes it seem like that's a kind of short process. Uh, it is, it is uh, you know, an intense journey to go on, uh, but doable. Now, especially if you think that just cutting out these compulsions is all of the work, recognize right now we are, we are what, 10 minutes into uh, our exploration here. This is a tiny, tiny piece of the work, small piece of the work. What we're going to look at a lot today is what comes after this. I find that's what's often missing when we go to therapy or we're interacting with mental health supports. Traditionally, therapy is just focused on kind of like the bottom half of the cliff, just managing that. This is totally possible to leave behind for good. And it's so important that we start to look at that, that this is a tiny, tiny piece of the work. There's so much more to explore. So if you're getting stuck though on this part of the work, here are some tips to help you with cutting out the compulsions. So first of all, this was so important for me to recognize. The compulsions I liked fueled the obsessions I hated. I thought I liked 
figuring out problems in my head. If I was going to go for a walk, I would head out there wherever I was going to go. And purposely before the walk, say I was walking to the grocery store, I would decide what I was going to ruminate on on the walk. Or if I was driving somewhere, I would, I would try to get lots of things to fill the space in my head. So I thought, you know, ruminating, spending all this time in my head, chasing certainty, I, I thought it was good. I liked it. I had to start to recognize that I was just teaching my brain that that was something we should do all the time. Or if anybody noticed the other day on social media, I was posting about what well, I see is a super simple mental fitness assessment test. Can you sit on a toilet without a phone? A lot of people can't do it. They would see it as very normal. I would say those are the kinds of compulsions I thought I needed, I thought I liked. But what I was doing was teaching my brain, we should always check on uncertainties. We should constantly be doing stuff. So then when there wasn't something going on, or even if there was something going on, my brain would just give me intrusive thoughts to be like, hey, go ruminate on this, go solve this. I taught my brain to do that. So I had to start recognizing that those compulsions I liked, they were a huge part of the problem. Also really key here, and we're going to come back to this later in the presentation as well, because it's so important. Compulsions are patterns. So like I was just talking about there, I had to cut out the patterns where I saw them as normal too. But to give you another example of that, I struggled with fears of, for example, on the driving one of hitting somebody with my car. And I would even, you know, I would have like false memories of oh, like, I would see myself hitting somebody and be like, oh no, I, I did hit a person. Okay, I better not drive because I've hit people, I'm going to get arrested, but also I'll, I'll kill more people. That fear is about being judged by others, uh, handling the guilt, like feeling really bad, uh, but also, oh, people are going to see me as a terrible person and I'll never be able to do the things I want to do in life. So we often recognize as that as a clinical issue, typical symptom, et cetera. Right. Anxiety creates a lot of anxiety, avoiding something, driving. It helped me so much to recognize that when I was sending emails, for instance, at work and I would check them again and again to make sure I didn't say something wrong, that that was the same compulsion. It's the exact same pattern. I was constantly checking emails that I was sending. I would go back and reread emails I'd already sent to make sure I hadn't said something bad in them. I would you know, write and rewrite and rewrite text messages. It helps so much to recognize that was the same compulsion. I was doing that because I was afraid of what people would think about me if I said something horrible. We often see the checking and rereading emails though as something you should do. We might say, oh, but that's normal, right? You don't, you don't want to say something wrong and get fired, right? But that's how we teach the brain to do that in other places that we find more distressing. We've got to cut out the pattern everywhere. Next up. Compulsions inside my head were no different than compulsions outside my head. This is so important to recognize. And, and throughout today's video, when I talk about compulsions, it's not just outside of your head. When I talk about doing things you value, it's not just about doing something outside of your head. It has to be both. It's about how we spend our time and energy. How we spend our time and energy inside of our heads is the same as how we spend it outside of our heads. There is no difference between going up to your friend and asking them for reassurance about what you did on the weekend and just sitting at home replaying the weekend in your head to check for reassurance about what you did. Those are identical. Because often what I see people doing is saying, okay, I've, I've cut out reassurance. I don't, I don't go and ask people to tell me what I did on the weekend and make me feel okay. But in their head, they're still checking it. 
And if we cut out reassurance, it means both. If we're still reassuring ourselves in our head, if we're still playing it over and over and over and over again, that's no different. That's the same as spending, you know, if we spend four hours obsessing about something in our head, that's the same as talking to somebody for four hours or spending four hours on the internet checking, oh, is this thought normal? Is this, does this feel real? Is this okay? Et cetera. They're the same. It helped me to focus on actions. Uh, not the presence or absence of thoughts or feelings or physical sensations. And this is really important in a couple different ways. So not only is this about tracking the progress of recovery, it's a progress in recovery has nothing to do with whether the intrusive thoughts are going away or not, whether I feel better or not, whether I feel less anxiety, I don't feel depressed, etc. <clears throat> whether I feel more certain, anything like that. It's not about that. It's got to be about actions. I define mental health as the practice of being ourselves while having any thought or feeling. So if the feelings are there, that's great. I'm going to do things I value. If the feelings aren't there, that's great. I'm going to do things I value. And so this goes as well for if we're searching for a feel. <clears throat> Excuse me. Often we want to like get a feeling of certainty or get a feeling of happiness or enjoyment. And when it's not there, we say, oh, like, I don't, I don't have a feeling. What's wrong? I've got to control this. I've got to get that feeling back. Or even a feeling of anxiety isn't there. And so we had an intrusive thought and then there was no anxiety. And we're like, oh, no, what does that mean? Does that mean I like the intrusive thought? Oh, no, I should be anxious. All of that checking and attaching meaning to feelings is just more compulsions. Whether we attach meaning to a feeling not being there good or bad. If we're like, oh, wow, it's so amazing. There's no anxiety here. Today is a good day. That is totally going to set you up for disaster. No anxiety there. Doesn't make a difference. You're going to do things you value. If there is anxiety there, doesn't make a difference. You're going to do actions you value anyway. One more here. I had to cut out compulsions. You see that? Well, make my video go away here. I had to cut out compulsions unreasonably. What this means is that we're not doing this to, you know, cut out compulsions because we want to control thoughts or feelings, right? Because they're irrelevant. So we're not cutting out compulsions to control thoughts and feelings. We're not cutting out compulsions because we feel bad uh, and we want to fix that because what happens then is then when we're feeling good, we stop doing the healthy work of cutting out compulsions. So then we relapse. Uh, we're not looking for motivation to cut out compulsions. Because again, if we're chasing a feeling, then the feeling's not going to be there. And then we're going to be stuck at the bottom of that cliff. <clears throat> we got to cut out compulsions just because I want to give my time and energy in life to things I care about. Spending it on all these uncertainties, that's just not stuff I care about. We've got to do it just because it's a thing we do. Oh, no, I, I did have one more. And so key to recognize here, intrusive thoughts are compulsions. Something that I'll hear a lot is people say, oh, I, um, I, cut, I, cut out, I cut out all of the compulsions, but I still have intrusive thoughts. Oh, it's terrible. What's wrong? I say, no, but there's very definitely compulsions happening because... Again, just like we were saying, mental compulsions are the same as physical compulsions. And so if your brain is throwing up thoughts, and so if the brain throws up a thought, and then we go, oh, that's bad, that shouldn't be there, I've got to fix it and control it, that's a compulsion. Just like if we were walking down the street, and we saw a tree, and we're like, oh, that tree is bad, it shouldn't be there, that, that tree has ruined my day, I need to fix it, I can't, I can't progress in my day until I've cut down that tree and turned it into wood chips and lit it on fire. That's what we do with intrusive thoughts. They're just thoughts. They're just like trees. They're like clouds. But we then judge them. We say, oh, that intrusive tree, that intrusive thought, it shouldn't be here. That stuff we do to the thoughts or the trees or the clouds or the garbage. Cutting out compulsions has got to involve cutting out the compulsions we do to judge and label and hate on thoughts. 
So as long as we keep hating on thoughts, like those thoughts shouldn't be here, they should go away, the brain's going to keep giving them to us because it's an easy way to get us to do compulsions. All the brain has to do is bring up that old thought, that old phrase, that old image, and if we go, ah, oh, I hate it, get rid of it, and then we start doing the compulsions, it's got us. So really recognize intrusive thoughts are about stuff we do in our heads. Because the brain, the brain is just throwing up thoughts. It's just like, here's a thought, here's a thought, here's a thought. We're the one that decides which thoughts we react to and judge and hate on. And if we do that, it's going to keep giving us more of them. Keep an eye on that. So a bunch of compulsion busting tips there. Again, the compulsions I like fueled the obsessions I hated. Compulsions are patterns. I had to cut out the patterns where I saw them as normal to compulsions inside my head were no different than compulsions outside of my head. Help to focus on actions, not the presence or absence of thoughts, feelings, physical sensations. I had to cut out compulsions unreasonably and super extra, extremely key on this journey. Intrusive thoughts are compulsions. Compulsions that we do to thoughts in our heads. So when we master that, we are, no, we are still, we are still just getting started on this journey. Let's talk about the plateau. So what we're going to look at with the plateau are some really common ways I see people, uh, and I did this when we're working on these practices. We get up to that point where we're like, whoa, I've, I've made a lot of changes. But remember, we're still on the edge of that cliff. Yeah, sure, we've climbed the cliff. Or maybe we're on a ledge on the cliff and we're like, wow, I can see, I can see so much now. It's so different. We got to watch out, though. Here are four super easy, quick ways to fall back down the cliff again and again. And you'll see if you, if you caught the previous version of this presentation at the OCD UK conference, there's a new super easy, quick way to fall back down. There were only three last week, but I realized I have left out one that's so important and common. And so uh, I've added it in and let's explore. First up are systemic barriers. I feel that these don't get covered nearly enough in our mental health care system. So what happens is you climb a cliff, you're really happy, like I'm making progress, look at all of these changes. But and this often therapists are responsible for this or we're responsible for this. We take this very narrow individualistic approach to what we're doing. We see it as, oh no, I I have some problems inside of me, I'm gonna fix them, and then boom, I can do all the things I wanna do in my life. But the challenge there is, there's a lot going on around you which may be working against you. So systemic barriers, we get up there, as you can see, it looks like our, our really happy cliff climber has stepped on a systemic barrier mine. And if we ignore the systems around us, they will have no issue uh, with blasting us back down the cliff. And these are things like racism, sexism, uh, homophobia, transphobia, poverty, systems around people that force them often into doing compulsions, that put them in a situation where they're, they're having to protect themselves from getting attacked. They're having to manage all sorts of problems. And that's really putting them in a place where they don't have the capacity or the supports to make big changes. And so it's so important to recognize too often in our system, someone will get labeled as being, say, treatment resistant. Because, yeah, they, they, didn't, they didn't make the changes they needed to make. They didn't have the space to do that work. But if you're in a situation where you're working two jobs, you're not getting good sleep, uh, you have to, you know, you're living in a neighborhood where actually there, there is a lot of violence. People do get robbed frequently. People, like, people are getting shot. Uh, of course, you're going to be doing all of these safety behaviors to manage that uncertainty. 
or if somebody's in an abusive relationship, they're going to be doing all sorts of things to manage and control. If somebody has to hide who they are because their sexuality can be persecuted where they live, that practice of pretending to be somebody else we know is going to put them into doing compulsions. And that's going to create a lot of anxiety because they're constantly going to have to be managing what other people think about them. We know that's going to create a lot of anxiety for that person. So it, you know, it doesn't matter how many compulsions they cut out, if they have to keep practicing compulsions to protect their life, it's going to be really challenging for them. And so part of it's recognizing that. Uh, and having that compassion for ourselves. If we see, oh, I, I, I cut out the compulsions. Why am I not making progress? Uh, or I cut out the compulsions. Why does this keep happening? But we, we really need that systems level look at, okay, yeah, you know, you've done what you can do, but are there systems around you that keep pushing you back? And so it's really important uh, for mental health professionals, for community members to make sure that we're dismantling those systems so that they're not pushing other people back, but also for anybody taking this journey to really be aware of the systems around you. You can't just look at, okay, the problem is only in my head or the problem is only in actions I'm doing. What are the systems that are pushing you into those actions? It's going to be so, so important to look at them. Next up, seeing yourself as a problem to fix. And this is key. This, this quickly becomes a compulsion for so many people. And it's fueled partly too by that progress we make. Because we like it. You know, we're, we're, we're climbing that cliff. We're solving problems. We've changed things. Like, I feel so good about controlling this. I want to I wanna fix more and control more. But, you know, we get up to the top of that cliff and... You know, the brain starts to throw up intrusive thoughts less, like there's less anxiety. And we've been, you know, basing our happiness around like fixing problems. We're like, oh, my only goal right now is like, I want to, I want to fix mental illness. I want to, I want to build mental health. I want to get out of my head. Our goals have been very focused on fixing ourselves. But then the issue with that is, as we make that progress, as we make those changes, we lose that engine we were using for happiness. I mean, we don't have problems anymore. And suddenly we're not happy and we're not enjoying things and we don't know where to go because fixing problems was also showing us where to go in life. And so unfortunately, what do we do in that situation? Often we get into a lot of self-sabotaging behaviors and we shove ourselves back down the cliff by creating new problems. And that, that can look like something as simple as overwork where, you know, we had, we were doing all of this work, doing all these compulsions and so on. Now the compulsions are gone. Brain's not throwing up all this, these intrusive thoughts. And so we maybe push into a toxic environment at work. We don't keep good boundaries. We just take on all sorts of extra work on, on difficult projects because we want to be the one who solves the big problem because we've come to see stress and managing stress as a pathway to happiness, what we think of as happiness. But really, we've mistaken happiness for fixing problems. And so we start to chase problems. So watch out for this. You are not a problem to fix. That's one of the reasons we look at this geography of recovery. There is going to be a cliff you need to climb. There will be some major problems you're going to solve at first, some big compulsions you'll cut out. But it's so important to recognize that is one practice you're going to do at one time, and then you've got to move on from it. You've got to see you're more than a cliff climber. The wilderness is, is wide. There's so many things to explore. But if we see ourselves as, no, like, I'm really good at climbing cliffs. I really like myself when I climb a cliff. Then you're going to keep finding yourself going back down a cliff just so you can climb up it again. You got to make it okay to move on, to see yourself as more than a problem. 
you are not the cliff. You can define yourself as successful for more than climbing cliffs, for more than solving problems in your head. And so really watch out for this one. One of the ways that I see people get stuck on this a lot uh, is on social media, for instance, when people want to engage with, uh, you know, share about mental health tools and stuff like that. Uh, a big red flag around this is when somebody defines their social media handle by the problem. You know, when they, <laughs> I described this in one video is like, because if they really hate vegetables and they define themselves as vegetable hater 2021, and I, I want to reduce the stigma around struggling with vegetables. And they really, really see themselves and define themselves as cliff climbers and people who are solving this problem. How are you going to leave the problem behind when it's your identity? Next up, and kind of related to this, staying at the edge of the cliff to watch it. This is connected to the fear of relapse and obsessing about recovery. Uh, so you saw earlier, just to reiterate, this person, one of their compulsions was obsessing about recovery, right? Really common, trying to get recovery right because there's this fear. Oh, no, I don't want to relapse. If I keep relapsing, it means there's something permanently wrong with me. It means I'll never get to do the things I want to do. It means I don't have control over myself, etc. We can easily react to that fear by turning it into any other fear. You see, as the little person saying here, I don't want to relapse. That's as bad as getting poisoned, right? And so they're afraid of it. They're afraid this thing's going to happen to me. I don't control it. Reacting to that fear is no different than any other fear. If we are constantly checking recovery, and because oh, I, I really want to make sure I'm recovering, am I recovering? Uh, I want to get that feeling, that certainty that I'm not going to relapse. That is an easy, simple way to relapse. Because then we start checking. We tell ourselves, oh, it's not reassurance. This is for my health. I'm taking care of my mental health. I'm not, oh, it's not a bad thing. This is, this is what I value. I value supporting myself. I, I want to make sure I'm going to stay recovered. And I'm just curious. So we stay there. We keep doing the compulsions. And something will happen. So usually it's the case that at first we can get away with doing the compulsion because, yeah, maybe things are pretty easy in life. You know, financial health is good. Job is stable. Life around us, relationships, there's no pandemic or something like that. And so doing the compulsion seems fine. But what will happen, why you see those kind of those pebbles, those rocks falling off the cliff, is that something will change in the environment. There'll be an increase in uncertainty. And suddenly you can't get away with doing those compulsions anymore. And that increase in uncertainty will require us to do more compulsions. We'll suddenly find that that way of doing things doesn't scale. And we're off down the cliff. The fourth one. This is, like I was saying, super, super key and important. I can't believe I forgot it on the previous edition of this. Let's get into it. Believing that new uncertainty is very different and very real. So we're up there. We've cut out a whole bunch of compulsions. We're like, wow, my brain's so different now. This is amazing. Oh, but here's a new uncertainty. And we're like, well, I've recovered in this uncertainty. This is new. And we even tell ourselves that, you know, this uncertainty is totally new and different from other uncertainties, even though that it doesn't really make any sense, many, any sense, like an uncertainty is an uncertainty. It doesn't matter if it's a blue uncertainty or a green uncertainty. It doesn't matter the superficial topic. An uncertainty is an uncertainty. Like I was mentioning in the compulsion busting tips, it's so important to focus on actions. Even if the uncertainty, if you judge it as different, the compulsions are the same, the checking, the coping, the controlling. So if we, if we judge a new uncertainty as a reason to do compulsions, what the brain is going to do 
is just keep giving us new uncertainties. That's why people will often say, oh, like my, my themes keep switching. The topic of the anxiety keeps changing. It doesn't matter because the topic never mattered. The brain just cares about the compulsions. So that's why it'll switch topic because it's trying to find a thing you'll react to. We really have to keep the focus on the reaction. Otherwise, the brain will just keep going. It, it does this thing, which I call throwing spaghetti at a wall. The brain is just going to start throwing out uncertainties, weird images, violent things, sexual things, whatever, just to see which one are you going to do compulsions around. Because the brain never cared about the topic. It just wants you to feed it the compulsion. So watch out for this. There is no such thing as a new uncertainty. It doesn't matter if it's a real uncertainty. It's about how we interact with it. It's about the actions we do, not about the topic or the flavor or the scent of the uncertainty. And that brings us to a new direction. So you've climbed the cliff. You've learned not to react to a new flavor of uncertainty. Uh, you're not going to base progress on fixing and solving problems anymore. You've addressed the systems around you. So even if you can't change them, you know how to navigate them. You're not going to stay at the edge of the cliff to keep checking and making sure you're not relapsing, that you are recovered. Now you have to do something that's so key. And I feel this is yeah, rarely talked about and we need to talk about this more. We need to shape our mental health care system around this more. You got to walk away from the edge of the cliff. For me, that also meant, you know, even ditching the diagnosis. Like I would very quickly on my journey, so this, many years ago, when I first started to talk about mental health and I, you know, start getting invited to do presentations and things like that at conferences and things, uh, people would often at first want to introduce me as, oh, you know, this is Mark Freeman. He has OCD and an addiction and, and blah, 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 anxiety, depression, et cetera. And it was really important. And often it was kind of weird at first when I was just starting out uh, because people, you know, people would invite me to their whatever conference for their purposes. Uh, and, and I was kind of new to all this. So they would have a bio that described me in a way that fit their purposes. And I would have to often correct people and say, well, no, I'm not like, I don't, I don't have any of those diagnoses anymore. I'm, I'm not, I'm not stuck on the cliff. I'm not climbing the cliff. I'm not going to define myself by the cliff. Uh, I'm going to leave that behind. And for so long, we've just stuck a mental illness diagnostic label on somebody and, and left it there. And so I'd say for people in the community, but also for professionals, we have to give people a way to leave that behind. Just like, just like we do in physical fitness. We don't keep saying you're a person who's recovering from a drowning disorder. I mean, if that was the case, there would be no swimmers. Everybody is just in recovery from a drowning disorder. Or every runner is in recovery from an endurance disorder. Or somebody wanted to build strength at the gym. We don't say, well, like you, you have a weakness disorder. And, you know, here today we welcome these bodybuilders to the stage to tell us about how they're in recovery from a weakness disorder. We don't, we don't do that. But in mental health, we do do that. I would say it's a, it's a huge problem because we essentially, we require people to stay at the edge of the cliff. We stick a label on them. We've got to walk away from the edge of the cliff. And as we do, and like I was saying earlier, we begin to see how this is such a tiny, tiny piece of the puzzle. The, the cliff, and, and I could have made the cliff even much smaller. I kept, I kept it large just for the sake of the words. But that cliff, it, it's actually so, so tiny. 
compared to all of the territory and wilderness we can cover on our journey to do amazing things, to do the things we really care about in life. We have to walk away from that. But as you start to walk away from the edge of the cliff, the brain has one more key trick up its sleeve. It is not giving up just yet. Or another way to think of it is that this is a, a really natural component of this journey. And it's something I, I do not see talked about a lot. But as I've been working with people over the years, this has become more and more, or I've recognized more and more that this is a consistent part of the journey in some form. It was for me. And it comes up for so many people, physical issues and pain. And what I mean by this, you, I, I have a bunch of videos on it that I just shared, not really because I showed it years ago uh, when I you know, had just kind of taken this journey, not seeing it as not knowing it was a consistent thing that people run into. Like I used to have all sorts of strange headaches uh, that I had never felt anything like that before in my life and never have again, where it would just, my head would tingle. It would feel like it was tingling inside my skull in a painful way, like ripping a Band-Aid off when I would cut out compulsions. I, I had always had a lot of digestion issues, but they really uh, ramped up as I was making a lot of progress with cutting out compulsion. So not in the beginning, but really as I was starting to leave the cliff behind. I also, when I was cutting out a bunch of big compulsions, after, after I had done therapy, there were a lot of compulsions that weren't considered OCD. So when I was doing therapy, it was specifically focused on OCD, but I had lots of other compulsions. So I had to cut out the other ones on my own. When I was working on a bunch of those, something I ran into was falling asleep at weird times. So I would, I would, come home from work, I would cut out the compulsion at you know, six o'clock at night, and then I would just pass out. It just, it was so physically draining. So physical pain, a lot of physical things not working the way they were supposed to, or not, no, they, actually I would I'd change that. Yeah, they're, they're not supposed to work well. In general, the body doesn't work well, uh, but things not happening the way I'd expect it. As we make these changes, so particularly further along, when you've really cut out all of the clinical stuff, it's very common. Now I see this happen to people all the time. It's very common that people will run into some kind of physical issue. And so often the form that takes, say, I, you know, I've been working with somebody, they, they've, they've made all of these incredible intense changes. They're doing things they'd never expected in life. We've stopped working together. They're like, hey, I'll, I'll check in sometimes. But yeah, I know the skills now. I'm going to take them and run with them. They're doing amazing things. And then after a couple months, I'll get a message. And it's often in the form of, hey, I've, you know, I've gone to like three doctors, four doctors now. And there's this thing. And they, you know, they all, all four doctors think it's like a different thing. Um, it's causing me a lot of discomfort and I'm having, like, I'm doing all this checking on it, looking it up online, trying to get treatments and help and things like that. And nothing is really, uh, working. And this is whatever happens where it's kind of like, we've, we've taken care of stuff up here and it's almost like the brain moves into something in our body and is like, I have one more way to get you to do compulsions. I'm going to mess up something. And it throws up totally real, absolutely legitimate physical issues. And we've got to learn how to handle those in a way that's still moving towards our values and shifting them a bit. So they're not a barrier. They're going to come along with us. And we're not going to do compulsions around them. You know, maybe we are going to have to do some kind of treatment around them, but we're doing that in a way uh, that it's just a thing we do. 
and we're gonna yeah invite if this stuff is gonna be here forever maybe i will never sleep normally again maybe yeah digestion will never be the way i want it to be again fine i'm gonna accept that maybe this pain yeah maybe these headaches will never go away okay maybe this fatigue always gonna be there okay and given that context how can i do things i value because if we react to this stuff just like with the new uncertainty if we go, oh, this is real, though, I've got to I've got to do all of this controlling and fixing around it. If we go back to seeing ourselves as that person with a problem to fix, the brain's going to get us right back down that cliff again. So it's not about pretending these physical issues aren't there. It's about making them part of the experience. They're just like anxiety, just like depression, just like intrusive thoughts. They're experiences. They're going to be there. They're coming along for the ride and that ride is about moving towards what we value it's shifting that engine for action in life it's no longer about solving and motivating action based on fear and anxiety it's now about saying hey this is where i want to go this is what i want to do so where do you want to go What skills do you want to keep? So really, really approaching mental health is about building and creating things. We're not doing this to fix a problem. In life, we're not very good at getting rid of things. Life is not good at subtracting. When we do that, we're trying to be a rock. Like, oh, I don't, I don't want to have this feeling. If we don't want to have a thought, or we don't want to have a feeling, We'll never be better at that than any random pebble in a ditch. As humans, in life, we're most skilled at adding, at creating, and growing. So we want to focus this around the skills we want to build. Like I mentioned earlier, related to swimming. It's not about avoiding drowning. Because, yeah, if you want to avoid anxiety, if you want to avoid thoughts and feelings you can do that just avoid life it's very it's very simple you just sit in a cage and you don't go anywhere although eventually that'll make you really anxious and you'll hate that too but that's where that approach leads if you approach mental health as like oh, i've got to i've got to get rid of stuff uh, you're just going to shrink life it's like saying okay i, I want to avoid drowning okay yeah you just never go near water Instead, approach it as becoming a great swimmer. Sure, the, like the, there's a risk of drowning. That's, that's reality. That's how water works and human bodies work. If you, if you drown, that is not, that's not a, a chemical imbalance. You don't have a disorder. That's just how human bodies work. We want to work on the skills to swim through whatever that ocean of difficult feelings and experiences is in our lives. Now, though, something that comes up that can be a challenge at this point uh, with values, I get asked this question all the time. And we say, hey, values about where you want to go, what skills you want to keep. Because in the past, I know this is very true for me, in the past, what took me to the bottom of that cliff uh, were a set of values that actually just didn't work for reality. They didn't scale uh, to the world I lived in or the brain I had. So taking care of my mental health meant ditching those values in favor of values and directions that were more useful to me. But of course, because I had never done that, I had never practiced healthy skills in my life. I only knew how to avoid and control experiences. I didn't know where to go. I, I didn't know what skills I wanted to keep. At first, those directions, those skills, they might be obscured. And that's okay. We're in a wilderness. This works exactly the same way. If you're out in the wilderness, if you're exploring the forest, yeah, you, you don't know where a path goes. In the wilderness of your life, you, you've never explored that before because you, you haven't lived this life before. We don't know what will happen. It's very uncertain. 
And so we embrace that uncertainty. Curiosity is going to be a tremendous help on this journey, being curious about where a path leads. And through that curiosity and that discovery, we start to learn what we value. So recognize that when we talk about values and moving towards our values, we don't have to know what they are. We're going to try things. That old kind of very rigid way of thinking, that very black and white thinking, that was a big part of the compulsions. Now we're ditching that for a more flexible approach. We're going to pick a direction. Yeah, maybe it's, maybe it's not the best direction, but it's not wrong. We can't pick a wrong direction. We're just going to take steps and we'll give ourselves trust on this journey. And this was so key to recognize. I had to give trust to myself. That doesn't mean feeling that I trust myself because of course I don't. Trust is stepping into that uncertainty and being curious and trusting myself to handle whatever comes up. I don't need to know what comes up. I trust myself to handle it and learn and take steps lightly, start to understand where the path is, start to make new paths that take me where I want to go. And sometimes I'll, I'll step into a swamp or I'll find myself at the bottom of another cliff and that's okay. I can trust myself to handle it. I trust myself to explore that wilderness. It's easy to plateau if we're focused on problem solving and fixing something we hate because success then depends on keeping the problem. But if our focus is on something we love and want to grow, there's no limit to how far we can take that. So really look at what your goals are with mental health and fitness. If it's fixing a problem, if it's defeating an enemy, that enemy is going to be necessary in your life. Step away from that edge of the cliff, walk away from the cliff and make the goal about something you can keep and something you just want to grow and get better and better and better at. And the compulsions and the problems, they just become things that you don't spend your time and energy on. There's another way of looking at this metaphor. So uh, there is this uh, amazing group of people on uh, a recovery focused Discord server we have called the Mental Fitness Discord server. Uh, one of our members and, and moderators, uh, their username is Squidgeridoo. And we were talking about this topic the other day. And they had, I thought, a great metaphor that, yeah, if, if the wilderness metaphor wasn't working for you, here's, here's another version of it to do with refrigerators and food. And so Squidgeridoo explained it like this. If the food is all moldy and expired, yes, a great first step could be chucking out all the food that could make you sick. That's a really useful step for making space in your fridge. But if you only focus on throwing out expired food instead of filling up your fridge with what you want to make and eat, then you just end up hungry. So, you know, a goal here could be, I want to be great at making tacos. And, and even I would say that's a, that's a key. Everybody can adopt that goal. I mean, there's no, there's no more wonderful goal and, and purpose in life than to make wonderful tacos. If you're going to make great tacos, yeah, that's going to cover throwing out the moldy food. Yeah, you're not going to use moldy food. But it is going to mean getting great food. And it's going to mean learning skills to make those amazing tacos. Throwing out the moldy food is that is that first step going up the cliff. But yeah, just like with cooking, if all you've done is throw out the moldy food, you you have nothing to eat. And you're not you're not getting good at cooking. You just don't have moldy food. And that's that's what it is when we've, you know, cut out the compulsions. So okay, I'm not going to do compulsions around thoughts anymore. Okay? No more intrusive thoughts. 
that doesn't mean we've done anything useful. We've, we've just stopped doing something that, yeah, wasn't helpful to have in our fridge anyway. But we've got to make it about where we're going to go, how we're going to fill the fridge with that delicious food that we're going to turn into the best tacos ever. And everybody, that uh, brings us to a close. So of uh, this portion, we're going to switch over into question and answer mode here. Wherever you are on your journey, whether it's in the wilderness, whether it's turning your fridge into the most excellent taco making machine, be kind to yourself. Uh, this is this is challenging, but also really extend that idea of kindness to yourself. Making it about a thing you want to give to yourself and grow in your life is going to be kinder than seeing yourself as this problem and hating on experiences you're having and continually going back to the things you hate to control and fix them to feel like you're solving a problem. So know that it is possible to leave these challenges behind. Uh, know that your, yeah, your experience as you take that journey, like if you're running into all those, those weird physical issues and your therapist is like, oh, I, I don't know what's going on. Uh, yeah, it, it's okay. It is a normal part of the journey. And yeah, we need to talk about it more because it's totally possible to leave these challenges behind. But having people talk about that publicly is kind of a, a new thing. So let us, let us, let us talk about it. Speaking of lettuce in the fridge, let us talk about this more. Um, and that's the last, that is the last bad pun I'm going to do, uh, today. <laughs> and, uh, I mean, in terms of, of website, I have, you know, a slide here from, oh, when, uh, I was giving this, uh, OCD UK, of course, if you have more questions about this, uh, if you want to join the mental fitness discord server, hop over to markfreeman.ca or uh, connect on any of the, the social media sites, tubes, things like that. And with that, let's switch it over to our wonderful uh, community on YouTube and explore some questions. So I know, so first of all, I can see already here a whole bunch of you I appreciate this so much. A whole bunch of you uh, donated uh, while I was doing the presentation. So I just wanted to say uh, thank you. So Maxwell, oh, thank you so much. And I see Andrea. Oh, and I love I love the, the animated the animated cartoons everybody's got up here. Andrea, thank you. And NM Hicks. Oh, thank you so much, everybody, for the support. I really appreciate it. Um, it really helps us, uh, you know, yeah exploring this and, and doing this work. So thank you. Now, any questions about what we just explored or uh, mental health questions in general? And we'll, um, we'll get into them. I'm gonna just see, I know some of you were probably answering questions in the chat there. Well, I was doing the presentation, so thank you for that. Um, hello to uh, moderators. Thank you. I know Extermination, Little Miss Beats, I see you out there. Thank you so much um, for, for caring for the community while I was chatting there. Where should I start? Some people are pointing out a beard. Yes, there is. There is a beard. Some people are piano bike riding. Always, always a wonderful, wonderful skill. <laughs> oh, uh, let's see here. Here's a question I see that's not been answered yet. Uh, Infinity Gaming, he said, what's a good phrase to say to myself or tell myself when I feel doubts? So I, I actually find it useful to see that as a compulsion. So kind of repeating a phrase to ourselves or something like that. Uh, yeah, no different than, oh, I feel a doubt. I've got to go wash my hands again. Uh, yeah, that's, I would not see that as something that's going to be helpful. Oh, Lisa, thank you so much for the thank you. Uh, I said there, oh, you helped me throw out the food and now I'm learning so many skills in the last few months, riding a bike and learning the piano, building a proper relationship 
oh, Lisa, that's wonderful with your children um, through acting, you know, rather than acting through fear, becoming more in, aware of the environment and looking after our planet. Oh, enjoy all of those steps in that exploration, Lisa. That's so great to hear. Yeah, I'm, I'm really glad. Enjoy continuing that exploration. I think I know. Yeah, I know. You too, I find after we've explored a lot of changes um, and taking care of ourselves, yeah, often our, our focus does shift to the community around us and the environment around us. I know I've, I've definitely found that and enjoy, uh, yeah, caring, yeah, caring for our environment so much, caring for my community. It really becomes something that we can just keep growing and building. Barman777. He said, what do I think about SSRIs? I, I don't I don't think about them. Uh, I, I didn't take any uh, medication on uh, this adventure. So, um, yeah, that's best to, you know, if that's something you're going to explore, talking about that with, uh, you know, people who have done that, uh, people who have had good experiences and bad experiences. Yeah. Liam, yeah, he said, when we choose to not do a compulsion, what do we do? Yeah, values. Let's put it up there. We do the things. Yeah, we do the things we value. And so actually you could look at it. So this happens on a kind of a macro level, right? Like in general, we are moving away from the edge of the cliff. But in any given moment, when we notice an urge, we notice a thought pop up, something like that, we are doing this exact same exercise. There's going to be uncertainty about where we go. There's going to be a, a values we identify. We're going to walk away from the edge of the cliff. And we're going to do those things we value. Um, and so, yeah, in that, that micro level as well, it's always the same practice. And there you also asked, is reading books and meditating also seen as a compulsion? Yeah, if, if you're doing it to control a thing, absolutely. Uh, yeah, like I always say with meditation, when people... Uh, you know, want to use meditation to, you know, get rid of anxiety or calm down or they have a bad day. So they go and meditate. Oh, that's that's totally a compulsion. It will it will make things worse. Uh, meditation is great for meditation. And you said, yeah, reading books. So the thing I would always ask people there, because sometimes people have like read multiple books and they, they'll be like, tell me more. Tell me more books I should go and read. And I would say, yeah, go and buy a book related to actions you value because yeah the focus has got to be on actions but yeah you could stay at the bottom of the cliff just reading books be like oh i've gotta i've gotta read enough books to get certainty to climb the cliff no that's just putting the uncertainty in charge grab a book on something you value so if you recognize that you want to be amazing at taco making get a book on tacos when the brain wants you to go and obsess about mental health stuff, go make tacos, something that's useful to you, that's useful to other people. Uh, make books about action. Reading books about mental health is no different than reading books about weightlifting. I mean, yeah, absolutely, you can learn stuff. But if you're not actually going to the gym, if you're not lifting weights, that is completely irrelevant. Like you, you would you would get more results from like picking up the book and doing some squats with it. If you're reading books about mental health, it's gotta be about action. Strawberry Fields Forever said, is boundaries a value? How to work on your value? Uh, yeah, so the questions about values come up a lot. So I, I do have a values course. If you go to the toolkitstore.com, there is, if, or you type in, just look for values course toolkit store on Google. Uh, I made a, a, a online course with a bunch of exercises that you can explore uh, that are not, not in You Are Not a Rock, just focused around values. So some fun exercises to just like map them out and, and get creative. And through that, identify some values. Boundaries, absolutely, you could value the thing that you set as a boundary. What really helped me with boundaries was seeing it as building a castle. So it's not, it's not just about keeping something out. It's about creating a space where I thrive. And 
when you look at it from that perspective of what helps me thrive, what helps me do well, then it, yeah, it very much becomes a value. Seeing like, hey, I'm going to articulate for this thing I care about because it's really going to help me thrive. Um, and then too, we make it very proactive. Jake loves Jesus. So you asked there how to calm down about, from a panic attack or anxiety attack. And I would say, no, that is, that is actually the compulsion. And that's, that then becomes why the brain throws it up. Because if we only do good things, and this is very common, people do this around stress too. If we only do good things, when we have a kind of terrible, bad experience, what, like all we're teaching the brain is to keep giving us those. It is the way, so the way I describe this in my book is if every time your dog pees on your sofa and rips it to shreds, if you then give it a cookie to calm it down, what is it gonna learn? It's gonna learn to keep peeing on your sofa and ripping it up because that's the only time you take care of it. So we have to get proactive. Um, yeah, if so, I always say is like, look, if you have a panic attack, anxiety attack, okay, like, what if, like, I, whatever happens after, you know, whatever is useful to you, fine. Where where the real useful work is starting to cut out the compulsions that fuel them. So we want to get ahead of it uh, because panic attacks and anxiety attacks are a set of compulsions to start to check what's happening in our body, judge it, want to control it, and of course. We don't control it. So then we get more anxious, which causes more of the experience, which makes us want to control it more, which we don't. So we get even more upset and we spiral out into a panic attack. That's a bunch of compulsions we do. And so it's really useful to not do those. And that's where I found it more helpful to focus. Um, not, uh, not giving my brain puppy cookies after it pisses on my sofa. Glocka locking. Ah, so you said I was almost done with my recovery. And I thought I was doing fine until things started going wrong in life again, which made me think if things started going wrong because I let the thoughts in and now I'm back in square one. And so this is a big reason for taking this approach is that you want to ditch the whole idea of being done with recovery because that's where somebody climbs up the cliff and they're like, oh, I'm done we want to switch the goal to things we want to keep. And that's what moves us away. Cause yeah, if we just climb the cliff and then we're like, Oh, all done. I am recovered. Uh, then of course we're going to get pushed back down in some way or the cliff, the cliff is going to fall apart, right? Something's going to change in the environment. It really helps to even ditch the idea of like recovery. Just like with the swimming example, I was, I shared earlier, um, I'm pointing at the slides over here and I realize actually just now you, you can't see the slides. Uh, let's bring the slides back here for a second. Um, I, let's go back to swimming. Uh, that says swimmer. Avoiding drowning is not the same as becoming a great swimmer. The reason um, I also really like this approach is because the moment you start swimming, so it doesn't matter if you had an experience of almost drowning and yeah, or even like you drowned and somebody rescued you and they, they did full on Baywatch. They like ran down the beach and uh, they like resuscitated you and like you spit out a whole bunch of seawater and an octopus and all of that. So yeah, you, you died, you drowned. And now you're like, wow, I want to learn how to swim. The moment you go to swimming classes, the very first time you are now a swimmer. Sure, you may not be an Olympic level swimmer yet, but you're swimming. You're a swimmer. It's a thing you do. It helps so much to take the same approach with mental health. If you start learning mental health skills, you're learning mental health skills. Like, I, at that point, I would say, look, be done re with recovery. Said, so, okay, yeah, I had a problem. Now I'm about building skills. That I find is a much more useful approach 
and like, oh, I've, I've got to like go and f- recover from a drowning disorder. And when will I be recovered from the drowning disorder? And I thought I was recovered. I thought I was done with recovery. No, because if we're going to be a swimmer, we're just going to do that forever. And it's about a thing like I want to keep getting better at swimming. I want to learn more about swimming. I want to challenge myself. Just like with physical fitness, like I, I really like exploring more challenges around physical fitness. It's not about fixing a problem. It's about growing something we love, uh, growing things we enjoy, growing skills, growing capacity. Enjoy that growing and exploration. Marlos Morale said, I've noticed that not getting in arguments with my brain and ignoring intrusive thoughts makes me feel apathy. I'm a very sensitive and empathic person. Feeling apathy makes me scared. So yet this is exactly why, let's see here. This is exactly why this slide back here. um, Oh no, we'll have to go all the way back here. Boom, it helped to focus on actions, not the presence or absence of thoughts, feelings, physical sensations. I don't know if you were here for this part earlier, but I was talking about exactly what you're describing. Often we do compulsions around the absence of a feeling. And so like you see there, if if we're still using feelings as the fuel for life, then the brain can take away a feeling. And then we start doing all sorts of compulsions around that. And so it's really, that's why we do this stuff unreasonably. So that's the reason for this part. We had to cut out compulsions. We have to cut out compulsions unreasonably. So it's, it's not about doing it because we have a particular motivation. And then related to this is why we use values. because they become that new fuel. They are that fuel that take us away from the old way of doing things, which was relying on feelings to motivate action. And so at first, yeah, when you remove that old engine, it does, it's, it's like having no engine. And so it's very common that people just feel apathy because they're like, well, I'm not, I'm not reacting to anxiety and intrusive thoughts anymore. So like, what am I supposed to do? And it's, it's really tough at that, that first point um, because we have this, this really well-crafted engine that's fueled by anxiety and fear and control. And we've worked on that engine for years. So it's so easy to go back to, even though we now recognize that engine like, polluted our lives. I'm like, oh, that, that sucked. But, oh, I have to build a new engine based on values. That's hard. And at first, it, it, it can be quite challenging because, yeah, we do have to take those steps forward and start to build that new engine. As we do that, it becomes way more enjoyable. Like, I, that's what I always find so weird when people talk about, you know, like mental illness being chronic or like you'll relapse or something. There, you, you could not pay me enough to go back to doing things the way I used to. It, it gets so enjoyable um, to, yeah, live a life that's fueled by values and giving things we want to give and having any experience. Uh, abs- it's like so worth it. But yeah, when you start, you're going to have to build that engine. Um, and it'll, it'll, yeah, there'll be a lot of apathy. You'll be like, oh, why am I doing this? And that's where the unreasonableness comes in. Sticking to those values just because they're things I do. Sophia, yes, what can I do to get over schizo OCD? Uh, so part of it is recognizing it's not, it's no different than any other health anxiety, right? It's just a fear of losing control. Um, and it's so important to cut out the compulsions. Like if you're doing a lot of checking, if you're going online to ask for reassurance, you're reading other people's experiences, you're reading about symptoms of schizophrenia, et cetera. Uh, and also, 
just recognizing that, hey, if, yeah, if you care about, you know, mental health and, and not like getting, you know, if you think it's, you know, that mental illness stigma is a bad thing. I mean, that set of compulsions there is totally wrapped up uh, in stigma. Uh, many of the tools we use, like learning how to accept intrusive thoughts and stuff like that, that, that all comes from the schizophrenia recovery community was totally pioneers in the recovery movement because they would go to you know, a doctor. They're like, oh, you're going to be stuck with us forever. You've got to take uh, these medications to cover up the stuff in your head. And that, you know, sparked through a lot of really painful experiences, a community of people who got together as peers to learn how to accept experiences uh, and do things they value. Uh, and so, yeah, I mean, the, uh, and so it's, it's one understandable that there's a lot of stigma that, that we pick up from those around us, but yeah, not, uh, it is not useful. Uh, strawberry fields forever. I'm, I don't, I see you have a question about feelings, but I, I don't understand it. Maybe if you want to try rephrasing it in a different way, I'll take another look at it. Infinity Gaming said, I'm new to the idea of cognitive fusion, but it sounds exactly like how I've been living my whole life. I want to try mindfulness to let these thoughts float past like clouds. Yeah, I, I, I was I spent my entire life practicing cognitive fusion. It was great to learn that I am separate from stuff I experience um, and seeing too, it's not just about thoughts. It's about all of the stuff the brain throws up. It's about feelings, physical sensations, all of that. Hmm. Andrea, thank you. Bogdanov you said, how to work out in the gym when thoughts and symptoms try to scare me? It is just like this. They're going to be there and that's okay. What do we value doing? I value being present. I'm not going to spend time trying to fix and control this other stuff. Um, so whether it's physical issues, it's the pain, it's the intrusive thoughts, whatever. Um, it's going to come along with me. Yeah. Like I, I want to have intrusive thoughts and anxiety at the gym. Chris DS, thank you so much. Thanks for stopping on by. I said, I've noticed my OCD latch on to getting enough sleep. Oh yeah. Really common. And this is leading to rumination and worrying, meaning difficult to sleep at night, how to work on this. It, it, it's really common. Because so many compulsions or obsessions are about control. And so it's very common that the brain latches on to sleep. And because we also, we hear things like, oh, it's bad if you don't get enough sleep. And then we go, ooh, I've got to, I've got to control this bad thing. But of course, sleep, we don't, we don't really control. And so we, the brain hates that. It's like, oh, we've got to control sleep to prevent this bad thing. And we don't control sleep. And then so it starts to try to control it. And then that, of course, like so many compulsions, it leads to the very thing we are afraid of. So it is helpful to uh, look at all the different elements of that. So one, looking at what is that fear that I'm trying to control with sleep? So I want to change my relationship to that fear. I want to give myself trust. Yeah, that fear, I, you know, if I'm afraid of, you know, not getting enough sleep is bad for my mental health. Well, okay. I, I trust myself to handle difficult mental health. If I get pushed down that cliff, that's fine. I'm going to climb right back up that cliff again. I trust myself to handle that. During the daytime, what I find so important with sleep is to recognize that it's actually the very first things we do in the morning that are starting to teach the brain how it's going to act at the end of the day. So I would look very broadly at how you're managing and trying to control uncertainty, because if there are other uncertainties, you find it good to control. Then the brain goes, oh, yeah, we should control uncertainty because it could lead to bad things. Here's a big uncertainty that could lead to a bad thing. And of course, we don't control it. So it creates a lot of anxiety. So we can help ourselves by starting to cut out those compulsions in other areas of our lives where we can fix and control uncertainty. Um, and so cutting out that ruminating during the day around other areas 
is a big help um, for cutting it out at the end of the day, at the end of the day or night. And it also really helps to want to uh, want to have bad sleep, right? Like whatever that thing is that we're afraid of, we can want it um, and it's okay. <laughs> Aaron, so you saying my partner, uh, my partner heard you and called me out on having a bunch of books about mental health and that those are compulsions. <laughs> yeah, the, uh, it's okay. We all do that stuff though. And then we see it and we're like, okay, now, now I, now I'm going to, you know, switch it up. I'm going to do things differently. So Aaron, I see just down below, you asked the question, you said, uh, I've noticed anxiety is the worst in the morning when blood sugar is low. Is it a compulsion to eat to raise blood sugar and become less anxious? Or is your body giving you anxiety to tell you to eat? Uh, so I, I find it useful to just look at it separate from all of that. Uh, right, like, what's going to help you thrive? What's going to nourish you? I mean, you're going to eat. It's not about fixing a thing. It's, uh, yeah, just eating in the morning is such a great way to fuel doing all of the things you want to do. Um, so yeah, there, and yeah, there might be some right, really normal people notice lots of anxiety or increased intrusive thoughts in the morning. That's fine. I mean, but that doesn't have to be the reason you eat in the morning. Uh, you can eat because breakfast is amazing and there's so many great breakfast foods. Uh, Marlo says, he said, I fear failure. So I don't do the things I value because I'm scared. It'll prove I'm not good at it. Yeah. So is changing the goal to fail, um, on purpose helpful. Yeah. I, I, I find it really useful. It's, it's one of the reasons behind a slide like this. But like I was saying that, yeah, we're, we may pick a path in the forest and it's going to take us to a swamp. That's not a failure. I mean, we, there's no way we could know. We want to learn that. So actually starting to see failures are useful. Like they're, they're not failures. They're, I'm going to try things and things will happen. And then I'm going to look at that and say, okay, what do I want to do differently next time? And so, yeah, maybe I, I find a swamp, but saying, okay, this is a swamp, but what can I learn about the swamp? Maybe there are, are amazing animals in the swamp here that I can discover, uh, but yeah, tomorrow, when I pick a direction to hike again in the wilderness, eh, if I don't want to go to the swamp, I won't go to the swamp. I'll, I'll pick a different direction and try that. So really taking that learning approach, that let's explore approach. Um, and so, yeah, it's, so it's not even necessarily like I want to fail. It's that, oh, I want to learn. Like it's not, it's not even a failure. Well, Angela, Ailman, thank you so much. Uh, thanks for stopping by. Yeah, enjoy enjoy exploring your journey on the way forward. Please do share with us what you uh, what you discover in the wilderness. Regina, yeah, he said thank you for speaking about head noise pain, body pain increasing. This is happening to me at the moment with thoughts increasing. Just realizing it's my brain trying to get me to engage. Yeah, I, I find it's it's so key to recognize. Because the brain is just in charge of experiences and compulsions are around uncomfortable experiences. So whatever we're going to judge as an uncomfortable experience to react to, to the brain, it has no issue switching between those. But we, we often talk about them as quite different. And it really helped me to see that they're the same. And in fact, they often get mixed up. Like when I struggled with misophonia, right? So the the issues around sounds for me, it was very physical. I would hear one of these sounds that I couldn't stand and I would feel it in my body. So really I was trying to fix the physical discomfort created by the sound. And so, but it was almost like my brain couldn't distinguish between the two. Like it's way of hearing was to have a pain and, but that really helped to start to see that, oh yeah, like the brain, the brain's kind of bad at understanding experiences. And then because I was listening to the brain, I was also really bad at understanding experiences. 
oh, Jake loves Jesus. You're new to this channel. Your brother told you about the channel helping him. Well, oh, thank you to your brother. Thank you for joining us. Yes, Wizstorm1 said, when I'm super anxious, my OCD tries to make a compulsion of literally anything. What do I do? So this is actually a, a useful element to understand and maybe something that could have I could have added to the presentation. A lot of the times, the reason the brain is going to throw up intrusive thoughts or about like anything and anxiety is because the brain is trying to give us something to control. So often as we're exploring the wilderness, you know, there's all sorts of uncertainties in life. So the pandemic, uh, maybe something happens to us financially or, yeah, we have a big exam coming up or some job interviews. And that's a big uncertainty that we don't control. And so what you'll see is very often the brain then will throw up intrusive thoughts and even things that are like really terrible, but also like clearly wrong that, you know, like, wow, I would you know, never do that. But that's why the brain is throwing it up. Because it's trying to give you control. The brain goes, wow, there's a big thing over here we do not control. So I'm going to give him an intrusive thought I know is false. Because then he can go, wow, that's wrong. And we get that little hit of control. So kind of giving some compassion to ourselves, really seeing the brain's trying to help. The brain is trying to help you get control and so we, we recognize that, say, hey, thank you, brain. But look at the, the thing that it's trying to help you with. Um, and just like recognizing a lot of the times, oh, okay, of course, of course, my brain's throwing up intrusive thoughts right now because there's this big thing over here that I don't control. And I feel bad about that. And I want to control it, but I can't. So what am I going to do that I care about? How am I going to care for myself? How am I going to care for others right now? Uh, because, yeah, there's this big thing I don't control. But I understand why my brain wants to control it. Oh, Strawberry Fields. So, yes, you explained more. You said, what I mean is, like, when you want to reach some feelings before doing things, for example, have a social interaction, so if you feel anxious all of a sudden, you must cancel the plan. Is that a compulsion? 100%. Huge. Like actually what you, the, what you described there when you said when you want to reach a feeling before doing things, that is a compulsion. It really helped me to see as, as a pattern. Remember earlier we were talking about patterns and compulsions? That's the pattern. Wanting to get a feeling before doing a thing. So many compulsions rely on that. Like when people want to get a feeling of safety before leaving the house. So they're doing all sorts of checking again and again, doing like lots of cleaning, etc., to feel okay to leave the house. Yeah, it's a compulsion. Then what happens is we have to do it more and more and more with social anxiety. If we have to get a feeling like we want to go and interact with people or we feel calm or we feel good, all we do by avoiding that or trying to control it is make it more and more difficult. So eventually we end up never getting the feeling. And so we never do those things we care about. So it's gotta, it's gotta be about the values and the actions, right? Like I was talking about around the compulsion tips, the feeling doesn't matter. If I have a bad feeling that I shouldn't talk to people and I value talking to people, I'm gonna talk to people. If I have a good feeling that I should talk to people, doesn't matter. I'm still just going to talk to the people that I wanted to talk to. If I have no feeling, I'm still going to talk to the people that I value talking to. Right? The action has nothing to do with the weather inside of our heads. Angela, I see, yeah, you're sharing a really, some really great insights there that are useful. Thank you for sharing that with everyone. Right, and related to what we we're talking about there, you said, yeah, because that action of moving in a positive direction is what shows that I care, not having a certain feeling about it. 
so important. Suleiman, he said, I have intrusive thoughts. And when I listen to them after it says to me, you haven't done um, your compulsion or your composition properly. Yep. And that's okay. It doesn't matter what the brain says. That's why it's so important to understand the actions that we value doing. Because, uh, yeah, of course, the brain's going to go, oh, you, you did that wrong. Do it again. Be like, nope, I did it. I'm walking away. And Washa said, is OCD just a problem of how you perceive fear? Everyone keeps talking about malfunction of the amygdala. Yeah, so I, I find it's not helpful to see it as a malfunctioning amygdala because the amygdala is acting exactly as it's designed to. Instead, I find it more, yeah, more helpful to look at, yeah, partly what you said there, how you perceive fear. So I have to talk about judgments. It really helped me to see that judging a thing as bad, dangerous, wrong, it shouldn't be there, etc. That's often where the compulsions start. And two, thinking about, uh, in many ways, because that's that's the amygdala's role. People, when people talk about fear, um, and and always, I find great. There's actually amygdalae. They're plural. We always talk about it as being one thing. You have two of them on either side of your brain, and they're not just about fear. Amygdala, in many ways, the amygdalae are in many ways categorizers. Because they, they also tell you if you want to go and have sex with something. They they tell you if, if something like, I, I want to go get that, or that thing is good, or that thing is bad. They're categorizers. And so it helps to see that after years of telling the amygdala that, oh, that thing's bad, avoid it, control it. They're doing their job when they then see something else, detect something else and go, whoop. That, that is like the other bad things you told us to avoid, avoid that. So I don't, I don't find it useful to see it as the amygdala mis, or misbehaving or doing something wrong because or malfunctioning. We taught it that those things were bad. And if you go back even further often, you know, our parents probably started teaching us that they were bad because our parents were reacting to their fears. They're like, oh, something bad is going to happen if you touch that. Oh, get away from that. You're going to fall. And we, you know, the brain starts to learn, oh, that's a bad thing. Don't go near it. So it's just doing what it's been taught. Now it's up to us to teach it some new tricks. And so understanding it's going to go, whoa, that's, that's a bad thing. You've taught me that's a bad thing. But now we're going to go, no, it's not a bad thing anymore. Let's go do the things we value. Uh, so, yeah, seeing, you know, the amygdala are really happy to learn. They're not malfunctioning. They learned that something is bad. Now we get to teach them what's great, what's fun. So I often think of it as uh, kind of being with my younger self and my younger self is afraid of roller coasters. Cause yeah, had a bad experience, was taught that roller coasters are terrifying and you'll die and you'll vomit and then die again. But now I've got to show him that, hey, I understand you're afraid I understand, yeah, your amygdala are going, bad thing, bad thing, dangerous. You're going to vomit and die. Stay away from it. But I'm going to show him how to have a good time, how to still have that experience of like, oh, no, this feels dangerous, but see it as fun, to see that rush as something to enjoy. Um, and so, yeah, we can teach it that. Heaven Sky. Yeah, you said, how can you deal with religious OCD without departing from your religion? Uh, so this is really common. Over the years, I've worked with a, a bunch of people on religious OCD. And, and it's it's really useful, actually, to, like with all of this stuff and looking at values, to really actually say, well, how, how do I practice my religion? How am I going to interact with that in a healthy way? And so actually, yeah, seeing it's not about departing from the religion. It is about, like with so many things identifying values and taking that step forward, embracing uncertainty. And I would say it's very common within religions that they're very good at learning how to handle uncertainty. So I would say, yeah, the, the answer is there. You're, you're going to probably find them in the religion um, and that the, the practice of exploring your, your religious practice in a healthy way um, is yeah really uh, directly connected to values 
um, and learning how to accept uncertainty while taking steps forward. So talking, you know, talking with, uh, you know, either uh, uh, a professional or uh, somebody in your religion who has a healthy approach, who can help you navigate that and learn some different ways of practicing that aren't caught up in like controlling fear um, can be really valuable. <laughs> I see too, a lot of people have been buying, buying mental health books. Y'all, you only need one mental health book. You only need one book on weightlifting. And then come back when, if it's weightlifting, you know, come back when you're, you know, you're squatting 400 pounds uh, or with mental health. Uh, yeah. Grab that book on tacos. After, after, obviously, after you bought You Are Not a Rock or The Mind Workout, that's the only book you need. And then only books about tacos. Damson said, yeah, do you have any tips on helping to see statements or images the brain throws up as background noise? Uh, right now, it's still a bit hard to not engage with concerns about it. Yeah, so one of the things to look at is like the concern. So it's actually seeing, because it's not about the statement or the image. It's about what we think it means or what we think it con controls by us doing the compulsion or hating on it. So part of it may be working on that concern. Like, what is the thing I'm afraid of here? Because that's, that's the fear I've got to learn how to accept. Because as long as I'm afraid of that, the brain is going to worry about things that could lead to that. But if I'm okay with that, then the brain doesn't have to keep worrying. So that'd be part of it, right? Like, look, what's, what's the concern? Because that, that's the real issue. Uh, and then the other thing for learning how to turn these things into background noise is to look at, you know, stuff like trees, for instance. We've got some nice trees right there. How do you see, why do you see back or trees as background? How do you accept trees? And starting to look at the things you do around the stuff you judge versus the stuff you allow to be there in the background. Um, and then it's about adopting those that same approach. Infinity gaming. Is, it, is ruminating about an awkward social interaction and beating myself up about being awkward a compulsion? Yes. Yes. Totally. Uh, Jake, yeah, I said I've mostly dealt with health anxiety. I go back to my doctor for reassurance about my heart a lot. Yeah. The thing is, too, we're going back to our doctor because we're worried about our heart. It often makes our, you know, our blood pressure higher and things like that. Jason said, can any person develop OCD or are some people more susceptible to developing obsessions? Uh, yeah, what, what I find useful to look at. Uh, so having had a bunch of different diagnoses um, and, you know, working with people in different diagnoses, I find it really helpful to see that. It really is a lot like physical fitness in that. So we have our mental health. And if we don't take care of our mental health for different people, that's going to manifest in different ways or it's going to express itself in different ways. At the root, though, yeah, you just have people not taking care of their mental health or being pushed into situations where they suddenly have to deal with a whole bunch of uncertainty. So they they're going to react with compulsions in a way that makes sense for what they've learned depending on how they try to control that uncertainty, they're going to pick up some different labels. But it really helped me to see that it still is just that person trying to manage uncertainty in their lives in the way they learned how. So I would say that's the kind of the universal constant. Because a lot of the diagnoses, you're really doing the exact same thing but maybe you're doing it in a different way. So an example I often uh, bring up is um, what's sometimes called borderline personality disorder or emotional dysregulation disorder and OCD. So I find it really helpful to see that they're, they are still managing the same uncertainties, but the person has learned how to do it in different ways. So with OCD, a person may you know, about some, some fear of getting abandoned or social anxiety or something like that, they may withdraw. 
So they're afraid, oh, these people are going to hate me. They're going to judge me. Okay, I, w I won't go. I'm not, I'm going to leave that relationship. I can't do this. I'm going to, they're going to withdraw. They're going to, and they're going to do a lot of compulsions inside their head. They're going to, in many ways, kind of like hurt themselves and, and minimize their life. But, and so, you know, we talk to that person and they might get an OCD label slapped on them. But then if somebody else experiences the exact same uncertainty, oh no, this person's going to leave me, they're judging me, et cetera. But they've learned to react by doing something to that person. They're still trying to control the exact same fear, but they may get a different diagnosis. Because maybe they start telling that person something that's not true because they hope that, oh, I, I, they're not going to like me, but I'm going to tell them something that's not true, either positive or negative. Uh, they're probably going to get a different diagnosis. But I would say they have done the exact same thing. They reacted to uncertainty about relationships by trying to control the fear. Uh, likewise, if they, they react to social anxiety, concerns about relationships by getting drunk all the time, and they're like, I can't have sex unless I'm drunk. Yeah, they, they might get a different diagnosis. They're gonna be like, oh, they have a substance use or an alcohol use disorder or something like that. Again, though, exact same thing. They're just reacting to uncertainty about relationships in the way that they've learned how. So I find it so useful to recognize that these all of these different categories, uh, they're not, yeah, anybody can end up with a mental illness diagnosis. I mean, they're, they're just categories uh, that we've invented. Like they're not based on anything physical. They're, they're just to categorize the way that a person tries to handle distress in their life. WW. Yeah, so what are some things we should be mindful of when identifying values to plan our day? How do you plan your day? You've mentioned that you usually write up things the night before. Yeah, and so I, I look at values and I ask myself, basically, what do I want to give? And, and I, I understand that in terms of actions. So that when I give that, I can say, hey, I gave what I wanted to give. And now, I don't know, we're going to go make some food. We're going to prepare. We're going to go exercise. We're going to go do whatever. And, and that may be also something that I planned. Like maybe what I want to give is, is uh, yeah, exercise to myself. And so I just look at it that way. Um, and I keep success close. I want to make sure I know how I'm going to celebrate being me today. And I make that a doable thing. And yeah, just keep it simple. And so it, and so it depends if, because often my day ends up being really scheduled just by say like client calls or meetings or something like that. So I, I, don't, I don't even have to do that much scheduling because it just, it is automatically scheduled. And then what I'm actually doing when I set up values is basically saying, hey, when I have free time, when I'm not on a Zoom call, when I'm not doing a presentation or something, these are the values that I'm going to look to. And I'm going to say, okay, well, which, which one of these do I want to do now? Um, and then I'll do that. So it's, it's kind of flexible, but that's uh, just because automatically my, my day will be quite structured anyway. Legacy. He said, how do I get over not knowing if I did a potentially life ruining thing? Yeah, so it's, it's seeing that that, how do I get over it? That is the compulsion. Uh, it can really help to approach this in the same way you would look at a contamination compulsion. So we often see life events like contamination. We're like, oh, I've done this thing. It has contaminated my life. Like I said, it's ruined my life. And in reality, it hasn't. It's a thing. It happened. And uh, yeah, you can do things you value. Yeah. Uh, there's nothing to get over. Trying to get over it is no different than somebody who is like, how do, how, do I get, how do I get over this feeling of contamination? I still feel dirty. Uh, and it's the same. And it can really help to see that uh, the, the brain relies on that pattern. So it's contamination compulsions aren't just about dirt. Uh, it can also be the fear that I've contaminated life and it should, it should be perfect. It shouldn't be here. 
Um, but yeah, trying to get over it is the compulsion. Yeah, we can just do things we value right now. We only have right now. Jake, have a good day. Thanks for stopping on by. Living with some acronym. You said obsessed about health every day. Just like you, I am running a marathon at medical tests, blood tests, cancer tests. Is there any way to stop? Yeah, you you stop it. You don't do those. Uh, that that is it. That's that that's that cliff part where you say, yeah, those are compulsions. And so it's starting to see that like if we choose if we're choosing to do those compulsions, we're choosing to make things worse. Uh, yeah, I had to cut them out. And that, that means, like, that's why, I don't know if you've seen before, there's lots of skulls around here. Yeah, it means changing our relationship with uh, death. Saying, yeah, you know what, I'm, I'm not going to do this compulsion. That means I might die, and I'm going to go do things I value. Because, yeah, today is my last day, and so I want to enjoy it. Oh, Lisa. So you said, if I started doing ERP, how long does it take to feel better? I get stuck on mental checking, testing if it OCD is still there, even after like one good day. Yeah, so really, really important to recognize that's a compulsion. Uh, trying to do ERP to feel better, that's that's no different than uh, trying to wash to feel clean. And that look for that contamination uh, pattern. It's, uh, yeah, gonna, it's just gonna feel it. It's only going to make it feel like more and more of a problem and even that idea of like a good day being like feeling better starting to see that yeah good good a good day has nothing to do with feelings you can feel lots of anxiety have a ton of intrusive thoughts and it's a good day because you did the things that you value but if you if as long as you want to chase that good feeling the brain's just going to keep taking you back to the bottom of that cliff Cause then, and then we're like, oh, I'm going to go, I'm going to go do ERP and fix this feeling. And then we're like, oh, it's so great. I fixed that feeling. And the brain's like, yeah, you like fixing that feeling here. Have a bigger intrusive thought. Cause then you'll really like fixing that. Uh, starting to see it's just like any compulsion. Joshy, you also, is mindfulness alone enough for recovery? Yeah. If, if you, if you understand that mindfulness means not doing any compulsions, like mindfulness is the opposite of doing compulsions. So if you're doing compulsions inside your head and so on, I would say like, well, what, what is there um, to recover from? Yeah, extermination thing here. It's funny to see how the brain works. I used to go to the doctor a lot for tests and reassurance. Then it completely 180 and turned into never going to the doctor for tests or anything. Uh, because of fear. Yeah. yeah. And as you say down there, now it's just about building skills and actions when it comes to health. And it, it is that like seeing it's about taking that approach of like, what's going to help me build health. Um, and then, yeah, what are those components? Cause yeah, it's, it's not going to mean even like, okay, I never, I never go to the doctor ever again. Uh, no, like, of course the doctor is, is going to be part of what you do, but it's about starting from that place there of like, well, what, how do I want to proactively build skills um, around health? Tio said, how do you remember your values all the time? Uh, I feel I need constant reminders and there are too many life situations requiring specific values. Can you give an example of, for, for instance, in creative work, how specific your values are? Uh, yeah. So in the creative work I do, so and I find it really useful to rank values. So I have one big value in the work I do, and that's to, to make mental health and fitness resources to help people, to help the most people access recovery. And so what I'm looking for then is, so is this a useful thing I'm doing like to other people? Is it a resource someone can use? And is it something that a lot of people can access? And that really guides my creative work. And so, yeah, there's still an element of you know, when decisions come up, being like, oh, okay, which one of these is going to be the thing that's most useful or most people can access? And yeah, there's that exploring element because, yeah, often I'll be wrong. And so I learned. I'm like, oh, I tried that. And yeah, that wasn't that wasn't the most useful to people. That wasn't 
the most accessible. So I'll, I'll do something different. And then we just get, get right back into it. And so, yeah, it's still going to be like trying things and exploring. Ji Young said, is fear of being watched or judged something to do with OCD? Uh, so I find it's like not even worrying about like, is it OCD or not? I, I find it's, it's a, a mental health consistent fear. And it really, like, it was something I struggled with. I just, and I just believed it. I didn't bring it up in therapy because it was true. I just believed it so completely. Um, and it really helps to cut out the compulsions around that. So that's what I'd look at. Yeah, not, not whether it's like an OCD thing or a whatever thing or whatever, an alpaca thing. No, it's just, a, it's not useful to do compulsions around that. And so what do I want to do instead? Sophia. He said, my mind is trying to convince me that I'm going crazy. As you said, I try to look at the mental illness without the stigma, but I feel like it's just making it worse. Yes, yeah, so, but it's, it's going to be really helpful to cut out the compulsions around that. And that brings us to the end right on one o'clock. We made two hours. Thank you, everybody, for stopping on by. Uh, I'm glad we could explore this. And now, too, it'll be up online. So if anybody wants to go through the presentation again, ask any questions, share about things you've discovered in the wilderness uh, as you're, you know, on that journey of recovery, uh, please do. And yeah, I want to say thank you so much to everybody for coming on by, for enjoying uh, this adventure again, for asking questions and sharing about your experiences and uh, thank you to everybody uh, who donated today. I really appreciate that support. Uh, it's, yeah, like I said, like this stuff isn't talked about enough. We tend to focus so much on just fixing those problems over there on the cliff, but there's so much more to this journey and it's possible to leave those challenges behind. So let's make it standard to talk about that. Uh, it's okay to talk about that. Um, and yeah, there's a lot there to discover. And so because it doesn't get talked about a lot, it's by us sharing about what we discover, asking questions, sharing tips, um, that we really create a community that helps people walk away from the edge of that cliff. Wherever you are in this geography today, I wish you well. And uh, please do uh, keep on taking those steps in a direction that you uh, really care about. Okay, so thank you everybody. Um, it was wonderful exploring. And uh, I look forward to exploring more soon. Uh, we'll be back, yeah, I'll be back on Wednesday, um, but over on Twitch. And then we'll do Twitch next weekend as well. But in the meantime, and Discord, in the meantime, uh, we'll see everybody over on the Mental Fitness Discord server. I don't have a link handy on me right now, but if, uh, yeah, you reach out or there's an article on it on my website on markfreeman.ca, just reach out. We'll hook you up with an invite link and you can uh, come on over. Yeah, I see. I think Kylie just tried to add a link. Oh, sorry. I don't know. I don't know how to turn on the permission to let you add that link. But uh, yeah, if anybody sends me a message or post in the comments down below, because then I can, I can post the invite link. And you can uh, come on over to the Mental Fitness Discord server. Lots of people there. Really great people with skills and experience taking this journey and uh, leaving these challenges behind. So uh, for now, we'll wrap things up there. And I will see.